we didn't, the only way we Scare people off. Well, like, like, okay, yeah. The you want to the Welcome to Berwick Academy's 205th commencement. Uh, for the last six months, this hilltop's been buffeted by some bad weather. Uh, I thank you all for risking uh, the weather this morning and risking our construction zone. Uh, Reverend William McConnell, pastor of the United Church of Christ in Northampton, will offer the invocation. Let us pray. God, we ask you to bless this event, and especially these young women and men whom we honor here today. You know them. You know their achievements and their escapades. You know about their classwork and about their good relationships with their teachers. You know about the usually friendly competition between those who have been in athletics and those who have been in the arts. You know who plays the oboe, who is good at lacrosse, who teaches self-defense, and who is involved with the bowlers. <laughs> you know about their internships and their projects. 
and their community services. Most of all, God, you know the special gifts of each of these graduates. We celebrate their gifts here today and ask you to bless our celebration and to continue to help them each to believe in themselves and to develop their gifts and each to make good contributions to this wonderful world in which we are set. These things we humbly ask in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Senator Snow, Mr. Clement, Reverend McConnell, trustees and overseers, colleagues, families and friends. It is my honor to present the class of 1996. It is always a daunting task to present a class, but after last night, it seems all the more so. Mr. Sherbon spoke about real writing, and that scared me. And then Jennifer closed the program without ever referring to her notes, if she even had notes. So I go at this with a bit of trepidation. I say honor, but four years ago, I wasn't sure that I would stand up here and uh, feel it was an honor. The class of 1996, uh, a good part of it, and I had just shared or concluded an ethics course. It was an experience designed to convince a graying headmaster that the time had, was coming fast to retire from the classroom. The class moved from discussion to debate to argument in the first moments of the first class and stayed there for the rest of the term. The class questioned and even the most obvious assumptions. Nothing was a given to the class of 1996. Nothing was taken on faith. The class was contrary. The class was irreverent. Looking to the future, I wondered how that class, that core, and the newcomers, their contrariness and their irreverence would play in the upper school. We have seen a bit of that contrariness, the overhaul of the election system, the co-presidents, Kenley's last semester in Greece, John Candy's famous newspaper battles, and even the unprecedented fact of one-tenth of the class from rural Maine traveling to New York City for college. A recent example took place on this field behind me. I was making my way in the morning uh, from Hayes uh, to uh, Burley Davidson. I rounded the corner of fog and staring me in the eye, shrouded in a little bit of morning mist, was uh, a, a stack of lockers. As I walked closer, I realized there was a design to this thing, and the design was Stonehenge. <laughs> Rebellious, yes. Contrary, yes. Irreverent, without a doubt. But perhaps that Stonehenge thing gave me something I could use for today. The Academy's age is a matter of pride to all of us. The class of 1996 is our 205th class. We are the oldest educational institution in the state of Maine. Stonehenge is five millennia old. It was actively used for 2,000 years. We come up a bit short on the longevity scale, but perhaps we are old for the new world and Stonehenge is old for the old world. The mystery surrounding Stonehenge has to do with its purpose. Was it a market, a place for law giving, a place of worship, a place even of sacrifice? Or was it a truce ground? Most attention focuses on the idea of an observatory, a place to record the movement of the heavenly bodies and to tell time, a matter of vital importance to an agricultural society. Stonehenge was a wonderful timepiece. In fact, in one aspect of timekeeping, the ancient Britons were 2,000 years ahead of our favored Greeks. There were good minds behind Stonehenge, good minds behind Stonehenge on this field also, good minds in the class of 1996. Its cum laude members include Jeremy Works, Dominic Rio, Sean Canada, Heather Furrow, Ryan Laub, and Jonathan Nielsen. Its French honor members include Dominic, Jeremy, Tenley, Ryan Laub, Chris Keller, Sean, and Chris Brown. Its Spanish Honor Society members include Jason Sudet, Kelly Spellman, Sandra Cruzavala, and Ryan Ellis. Dominic was a National Merit Scholar, and Jeremy was a National Merit Finalist. 
Nine members of the class were accepted early decision to colleges. Pardon me, 11 members of the class were accepted early decision to college. Alex Mead to Allegheny, Garrett and Sarah to Wheaton, Chris Brown, Sean and Chris Keller to New York University, Dominic to the University of Pennsylvania, Ryan to Tufts University, Jeremy to Dartmouth College, Sandra to Connecticut College, and Heather to Eckert. That is the highest sort of intellectual recognition. In nearly a quarter of a century of teaching, I do not, I have never heard of over a third of a class being accepted early decision to colleges of that caliber. Good minds indeed. The primary tool for Neolithic Britain was the Greenstone Axe. It is a remarkable instrument which could be used even to fell large trees. It is doubtful that sports played a large part in ancient Britain, but a recent discovery of a two mile long flattened area, a cursus, uh, suggests that perhaps marches or even races took place. Dominic and Kelly's Greenstone Axe was a tennis racket, and the time is apt to be long, hopefully not five millennia, before their records are matched on this hilltop. My reckoning is that Dominic and Kelly accumulated over 200 match victories for Berwick. Neither player in the last four years has lost a league match. Dominic has been the Eastern League MVP for four years running and has had both a New England and a national ranking throughout those years. Kelly and Dominic were constant EIL All-Stars. They were joined by Chris Brown, Kurt Jackson, and Heather who helped in helping to establish a winning tradition in tennis at Berwick. Dominic as MVP, Captain and Foster's Dream Team member, Jim Shirley as MIP, Chris Keller as Captain, and Jeremy as Captain, wielded the basketball and finished their BA careers with two strong years. Sandra as Captain, Kelly as Captain and MVP, and Jen Goulston led the resurgence in the women's basketball program. Eric Greeley as Captain and EIL All-Star, Garrett Morgan as Captain, EIL All-Star, NEPSAC All-Tournament player and MVP, Jonathan Nielsen, Dominic as EIL All-Star and NEPSAC All-Tournament player, Jim, Jake Potter, and Jeremy took the academy back to the NEPSAC tournament in this fall in soccer and held the best team in New England scoreless for 72 wonderful moments. Sandra as captain and MVP, Ashley Flynn as MIP, Sandra as captain, Jen Goulston as an ASGA All-Star, Caitlin Greenglass, and Jen Mazika as another ASGA All-Star started the winning tradition in women's soccer. Kurt as captain, Jason as captain and MIP, and Ryan Laub wielded golf clubs and helped Berwick accumulate a remarkable two-year startup winning record in golf. Ryan Ellis as the MIP, Sarah and John Candy helped establish skiing as a sport at the academy. Garrett as captain and Foster's dream team member, Eric as captain, Jim Myers, Jake and Jason, despite a tough year, despite the difficulties, kept the faith and kept hockey alive on the hilltop. Garrett as captain and EIL All-Star, Jason, Jim and Eric led Berwick back to the Eastern League Championship and to the NEPSAC tournament as runners up in baseball. Garrett's day against Pingree is the stuff of legend. 12 strikeouts, four hits, two home runs. Chris Keller is captain and EIL All-Star. Jonathan is captain, Seth Darlington, and Jeremy hefted lacrosse sticks and helped take Berwick to the NEPSAC tournament last year and to continue with the winning season this year. Sandra as captain, EIL All-Star, first team selection for the women's All-American lacrosse team. Uh, Sarah and Jen Goulston raised their own lacrosse sticks and led the women's lacrosse team to a strong finish this year and set the standard and the stage for next year. The class's contrary streak might best have been seen by David Goodwin, giving up his career in cross-country running in his MVP league status to turn to the bicycle, and by Ryan Laub with his remarkable national and international competitions in Taekwondo. Sports, athletics, greenstone axes, yes. In one other vital respect, Stonehenge tells us very little about the class. It appears that the visual arts were not as important in Neolithic Britain as they were in the rest of Europe. Perhaps Stonehenge was its own art. That clearly was not the case at Berwick, where Amy Ellis, Jen Goulston, 
Sarah, Alex, and Stefania Metallius continued the strong tradition of visual arts at the Academy as members of the National Art Honor Society. Music in Stonehenge will ever remain a mystery, but not so for the class of 1996. What am I, what is anybody to say about the weekend bowlers? At Spring Swing, Alex honored Kent Allen as the Reverend of Groove. The bowlers then can only be considered the apostles of Groove, and what apostles they are. Chris Brown, Chris Keller, and Alex may actually have spent more time practicing their music than they did studying ethics in eighth grade. And they were joined by Sean in the ninth grade, and they became the core of a wonderful experience at the Academy. Five guys named Mo will remain one of our song lines to use one of Mr. Fletcher's ideas. At a personal level, I could not help noticing the changing of the guard as this foursome kindly helped the eighth graders and middle schoolers along at Spring Swing. Those students, Charlie and Jordan and Mike and others, know the standard you have set for music at the Academy. Silent as the music of Stonehenge is to us now, so almost was the music of Caitlin. We heard her only once at convocation. Only one time would she allow that to happen. But it was enough to tell us why she'd been so successful in the Portland Youth Wind Ensemble. Jim Myers provided other musical memories, enchanted evenings in South Pacific. All of these folks became instrumental in founding another tradition at the Academy, the coffee houses in the basement of fog. Oh, how I wish past graduates could see that event in the basement of fog in the old pit. They were joined and occasionally even organized by Heather. Heather joined us as a junior, and what a gift she has been. Instrumental in the coffee houses, she also started what we hope will be a drama tradition with her two one-act plays. Her rendition of Mr. Amston's Remember on the evening of Fog Rededication provided us with another song line for this year. Heather's voice matched the words. I quote, I hear the voices call me, remember when we smiled far away up on the hill. And then there was also Bali High. The Stonehenge idea also has something important to say, perhaps more important to say, about the class of 1996 as a whole. Consider a few facts. The blue stones used to construct part of the outer ring of Stonehenge each weigh approximately five tons. The only possible quarry for those stones is 250 miles away. I think that was about 100 yards. 250 miles five tons, 5,000 years ago. The sarsen stones, the center or the ones uh, that we, uh, the lockers in our story, weigh between 25 and 45 tons. They number 82. They were quarried 25 miles away from Stonehenge. You may have had trouble moving those things out of fog. Mike, Paul, and Richie had trouble moving them back in. But 25 to 45 tons, 25 miles. Finally, the lintel rocks, the lockers over the top, weighed seven tons. These numbers are preposterous. As interesting as that how question is, the true wonderment is the why question. Think about it. Why would hundreds and thousands of people over tens and hundreds of years dedicate their lives to cutting, dragging, floating, setting, shaping, grinding, and hefting huge monolithic rocks. To keep time only, it hardly seems conceivable. The novelist Robert Fowles finds the answer to that why question in the name. Stonehenge roughly translated is stone hanging. And so the seven ton lintels are crucial. They are an impossibility. It is as if these Neolithic Britons had to do something that could not be done, that on the face of it was impossible. If you will, something only the gods could do. They started with bluestone, but success by definition demanded more. They turned to the sarsen stones, and again, success demanded something even more preposterous. Who but the gods could hang seven ton lintels on top of 10 and 15 foot pillars. 
when the class of 1996 moved those lockers out of fog, it was certainly doing something it was not supposed to do. But perhaps in some mythical way, the class was recalling the impulse of our ancestor, ancestors to do what was not supposed to be done, what could not be done. Does the class sound a bit contrary, a bit irreverent? Were not the music of the bowlers, the tennis accomplishments of Kelly and Dom, the early decisions for college, the changes in student government, the first time over 500 laps for the senior run, were not all of these hanging rocks, stone hinges, for others to marvel at, for others to remember? Remember when we smiled far away up on the hill, hanging stones to remember. Senator Snow, Mr. Clement, Reverend McConnell, colleagues, families, and friends, it is my great honor, and yes, I say it now, on the occasion of the Academy's 205th commencement, to present you all the class of 1996, the class of Stonehenge. Jeremy Works came to the hilltop in the fall of 1992 as a Berwick scholar. His academic accomplishments include his induction into the Cum Laude Society and the French Honor Society. Jeremy is a National Merit finalist. In his uh, free time, he was one of the Bulldogs, one of the stalwarts, one of the loyalists, playing 12 seasons of sports. Jeremy's great gift to the Academy was his commitment to the life of the mind, his sheer intellectualism. September will find Jeremy attending Dartmouth College. It's my great pleasure to introduce the salutatorian for the class of 1996, Jeremy Works. I'd like to start off by thanking my classmates for the last four years. They've really made my high school career an enjoyable one and something that I'll never forget. No matter how stressful a time it was, the senior class has always surprised me a way to make me laugh. When times were bad, Jim Shirley would always have a sarcastic remark. Chris Brown would be jumping around or doing something seemingly pointless, but it would turn out to be funny. If these two failed, just looking at Al me could make me laugh. <laughs> I'd also like to thank my parents for their support throughout my life. They have practically gone to every one of my games, which have been a lot, and logged practically thousands of miles driving back and forth to Massachusetts to watch me from the sidelines. They've also ready to give me advice on any topic. They probably don't think I listen to any of this advice, but I do, and I appreciate them to give Yeah. I appreciate them giving it to me. Finally I want to thank and congratulate Dominic, who is any teacher of ours will attest, has competed with me throughout high school. It has never been a com cutthroat competition. On the contrary, it was much more of a game between us. Seeing who would do better on a test or paper so we could have five minutes of bragging rights before moving on to the next homework assignment. So I'd like to congratulate him on, become on his becoming valedictorian. But let me say this, he's won the battle, but not the war. <laughs> I now have four more years of college to get better grades than him, and believe me, I'll do it. <laughs> Seriously though, this competition, support, and enjoyment that has surrounded me for my years at Berwick has really made me into the person I am today. However, if one of these components had been missing in my life, the other two would have been meaningless. Without competition, a person no longer tries to become better. Mediocrity sets in and a person becomes complacent with his or her own surroundings, no longer wanting to change the world. If you don't have someone else to compete against, Compete against yourself. Strive to push yourself to new heights, because even if you don't make those heights, you'll be higher than when you started. Pushing yourself is the first step in improving yourself. Without encouragement, deeds would become meaningless. People need someone to tell them that they're doing what they're doing has a purpose. That someone can be a family member, a friend, or even themselves. That people have faith in themselves is important, because if you don't believe in yourself, your quality of work is going to reflect it. Everyone should attack a problem with the confidence that they're going to solve that problem. When going to work on a problem, expect the entire time that the answer 
to the problem is within your reach. Don't ask if you can do a problem, but how you're going to do it. Encouraging yourself is the first step in succeeding at what you do. My last point is the most important one. Without enjoyment, any success or improvement is empty. If you don't enjoy yourself and what you're doing, you give yourself very, reason, very little reason to do it. I'm not saying that you should be happy in everything that you do, but don't do things that are going to make you unhappy. Some things like exercise is painful or boring, but the enjoyment you get from the results is well worth your, the hardship you go through to get there. Perhaps you don't enjoy writing papers. You still write the papers because you know that you don't, that there's going to be a whole lot of unenjoyment when your report card comes home. <laughs> If you yourself are happy after you've completed some tasks, then you know that that task has made your life better and more enjoyable. Enjoying yourself is the first step in giving yourself a reason to succeed again. Together, these three components give you a start on becoming successful in life. Encouragement gives you a reason to succeed. Competition gives you a reason to push to succeed to higher levels. Enjoyment gives you a reason to continue to be successful in all that you do. In closing, I would like to tell my fellow members of the class of 1996 this. To succeed in life, you should do these three things. Push yourself, encourage yourself, and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Today we are honored to welcome as the commencement speaker for the class of 1996, Senator Olympia Snow. Senator Snow is a graduate of the University of Maine at Orono. She started her career in public service as a member of the Maine House and was soon elected to the Maine Senate. Starting in 1978, Senator Snow served eight terms as a member of the House of Representatives. She was elected to the Senate in 1994, where her committee assignments include the crucial arenas of foreign relations and the budget. No one can accuse Senator Snow of ducking the hot issues of the day. It is my honor to present Senator Olympia Snow. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning. Headmaster Ridgway, Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Clement, Reverend McConnell, members of the faculty, parents, guests, and of course, the graduates of Baroque Academy and the Stonehenge class of 1996. It's a delight for me to be here today, and especially uh, being here at the graduation exercises of the oldest educational institution uh, in the state of Maine. Uh, it is my first uh, visit to the academy, and I'm delighted that I could be here on such a great occasion. Few occasions are caused for greater pride and warmer memories than a high school graduation, so I'm grateful for the fact that you invited me here today, and I'm honored to be able to share these special moments with all of you. Let me start by quoting Homer to you uh, from the epic tale, The Odyssey. This is the last time in high school you'll sit through the ancient Greeks. I'm referring to Homer, not myself, so pay attention. In the 11th book of The Odyssey, he writes, there are time for many words and there's also time for sleep. Well, that's quite true, and I just hope my commencement address won't be a time for both. I must admit at the outset here that it does give me a feeling of power to be your graduation speaker. That's right, power. You see, it occurred to me that I'm the only person standing between you and your diplomas. Now, if that's not power, I don't know what is. So thunderous applause throughout my remarks would be a wise move on your part. <laughs> actually, actually, as Andy Rooney said recently at a commencement exercise, I'm somewhere in between feeling important to be speaking with you on such a significant day in your lives and ridiculous to be standing here in this costume. <laughs> you may have mistakenly thought that getting through all those classes, assignments, SAT tests, gym, was the hardest part of your high school career. Well, you probably weren't warned about my graduation speeches. Well, I'll try to make my remarks as short as possible. I'd rather not find myself in the place of a certain minister who droned on a bit too long during a sermon. And finally, toward the end of his sermon, the minister looked up at his congregation and said, I don't mind it when you look at your watches to see what time it is, but I think it's a bit much when you tap them to see if they're still running. <laughs> in actuality, though, I have no grand illusions about the lasting influence of a graduation speaker. To tell you the truth, not only don't I remember what was said on my own graduation from Everett Little High School in Auburn, I don't even remember who the speaker was. And I don't need the helpful comment that my graduation was so long ago that I shouldn't be expected to remember that far back. <laughs> In contemplating what to say to you today, I couldn't help but recall Mark Twain's comment about Adam of Adam and Eve fame. 
Crane wrote of how lucky Adam was. He knew when he said a good thing that nobody had said it before. Well, graduation speakers in the pursuit of sound advice and lofty ideals to present to captive graduating seniors are always trying to find the good things that nobody has ever said before. I believe, though, that the key question probably in most of your minds is one that has been asked before. It's a question that was asked at the end of a classical political movie called The Candidate, starring Robert Redford. In that movie, Redford was the underdog candidate running for the United States Senate, struggling through countless problems and overcoming endless setbacks until finally he emerges the victor. After that victory, though, the tired and dazed Redford turns to one of his friends at the victory party and poses the question, now what? Well, here you all are, having waited and fought your way through four years of homework, tests, and my apologies to the teachers, endless classes. Now you, too, have achieved an unqualified victory. But the question for each of you is the same as Redford. Now what? Usually when that question is contemplated at graduation time, it's from the perspective of what you're going to do with the rest of your life, or some other similar non-threatening, non-panic-inducing question. Unfortunately, as you consider the direction your lives will take from this day forward, you probably won't gain much inspiration from the old Maine proverb that says, in Maine there are four directions, up river, down state, over to home, and from away. <laughs> but seriously, most of you would respond to the now what question by saying that you're going to attend college or become a full-time member of America's workforce. Or you might answer by saying that you want to be retired by the age of 21 or live your life in a way that Bart Simpson would wholeheartedly approve of. <laughs> that is, of course, a legitimate, practical, and natural way of responding to that question. But I would suggest that in the long run, there's also another perspective that you might want to take. You see, the choice of a school, career, or job seems to have such a finality to it right now. Once made, it's as if the decision can never be changed or altered. The reality, however, is vastly different. Whereas your parents' generation thought it perfectly normal to pick a job or direction and never change it, those of you graduating today will have three or four different careers before your working days are over. Not just jobs, but three or four different careers before you retire. How do you like that? I haven't gotten your diplomas yet, and I've already had you retired. The notion that this fluidity will be part of your lives was reinforced in an article I once read on attitudes of working people in their late 30s and early 40s. A majority of them, it turns out, were still wondering what they will be doing when they grow up. It's not really until people hit their late 40s or 50s the study found that they figured out that they finally settled on what their life's work actually is. Instead of trying to ma map out your entire professional life right now, I would suggest that you view the now what question and your future from a different perspective. Look at now what as a way of asking yourself what kind of person you will decide to be and how you decide to live your life. Because amid the shifting tides of life ahead of you, the one constant will be your character. Occupations may change, but the makeup of the individual lasts forever. This perspective will be of particular importance to your class because you, the class of 1996, are graduating into a world that has been and continues to be transformed in ways we could hardly imagine just a decade ago. For example, the miracles of modern technology have brought the images and ideals of the American dream into living rooms, from Krakow to Kiev in Europe and from San Salvador uh, in Central America to Santiago in South America. And today, the American dream is no longer confined within our borders of North America. Its stirring potential and its limitless power lit the spark that started a dozen revolutions across the world. And due to the wonders of modern technology, we're entering an era where yesterday's dreams will become the commonplaces of tomorrow. Yours is a world that has witnessed quantum leaps in the development of new technologies, from cellular phones to fax machines, from satellite dishes in our front yards to miniature Sony Walkmans in our back pockets, HDDV to DAT to VCRs to PCs, C-SPAN, CNN, MTV, and then CNBC. Information has never moved faster, reached more people, or done more to alter our daily way of life. And while we're at it, I should tell you that I have become particularly dismayed at one little innovation in, technolog in technology that has a particular likening to one member of my household, the former governor of Maine, and my husband. Uh, he likes the television remote control, no notoriously known in our household as the clicker, and along with it, the newly expanded 500 channels that go with it. Because that's not my idea of advancement, it's more my idea of regression. 
But seriously, never before in the history of our nation has our economy and our society changed as rapidly as it is changing today. Everyone in this class, no matter what direction you take in your lives, will be faced with innumerable conflicts along the way. And each of you have already shown the wisdom of choosing to stay in school and completing your high school degree. All of you know that having your high school diploma is essentially a prerequisite to full participation in our country today, and you have acted upon that knowledge. You begin your next steps with an enormous head start, an education. You have made an invaluable contribution to your future just by being here today. You have begun to build a foundation of skills with which, I hope, you will be able to attain financial security for yourselves and eventually your family. Hopefully many of you here today have decided to strengthen your educational foundation by attending college. As Headmaster Ridgway indicated, many of you have. And as the demands in our workforce becomes more severe, a college education will become even more crucial than it already is. And many of you will rely on student loans to help pay for that needed education. That's why now is not the time to be reducing the federal commitment to higher education. And that's why I fought to make education a priority in the balanced budget debate that we've had in Congress this year. And why I fought to restore more than $10 billion in the student loan program in the final version of the Budget Act. I believe that student loans are the great enabler in our country that have given millions of young Americans, including me, the keys that can unlock the doors to the American dream by giving them access to a college education they could never afford on their own. And I'm convinced I would not be standing here today as a United States Senator if I didn't have the ability to rely on student loans for my education. I would like you to remember that regardless of background or circumstances, a lifelong commitment to learning and education will provide you with the choices and chances you need not only to dream, but to make your dreams a reality. Because your world is constantly changing, you will need to be educationally and intellectually equipped to change with it. But change can be good and change can be bad. Ironically, the Chinese have a symbol in their alphabet which means change, yet the symbol also means challenge and opportunity. So your commitment to learning should not end here. It means it must go hand in hand with your dreams and aspirations. These dreams may change, but with a sound education, you will always be on a solid footing wherever your imagination takes you. Because of computer modems, the internet, satellite technology, and fax machines, your world will be an increasingly interdependent and interactive one. And the American workforce of tomorrow, the workforce that you will be part of, will need to meet the challenges of an increasingly competitive world. Did you know that more than half of the new jobs created by the year 2000 will require education beyond high school, and that two-thirds of the jobs we create here in Maine require a college education. As President Clinton indicated in his recent commencement speech at Princeton University, he said, no longer can we assume automatically just 12 years of education. We must now think in terms of 13 and 14 years or more. We need only look to Japan and Taiwan in the East and the unified Europe in the West to see that our future economic stability and workforce is in your capable hands. Their societies place a heavy emphasis on knowledge and the need to learn. And because of this, they have made great strides towards political and economic power. We as a nation can and must learn from this. We cannot afford, as the U.S. Department of Education reported in 1994, to let 381,000 students drop out of high school every single year and still remain an economic superpower. It is the class of 1996 that will determine America's fate in the 21st century. It is you who will face the pressing issues and challenges of the next millennium. How you respond to these challenges individually and collectively will be a reflection of the kind of character you develop, of the kind of person you are. What it will require, I believe, is maintaining a sense of responsibility to yourself and to your community, of not being satisfied in the words of poet Robert Frost to go with the drift of things, but rather to be engaged in the world around you, a full participant in the world in which you live, and to reach as high as you possibly can. This is an important message on this day, for it is a fact of life that the greatest limits that will be placed on your lives are the ones which you place on yourself. 
And this isn't, I might add, just another recycled graduation homily. Take me, for example. When I was sitting at my own high school graduation, there was absolutely no reason whatsoever to think that I'd ever be a United States Senator. I'd been raised in an ethnic Greek household by my aunt after having lost my parents at a young age. And we weren't exactly overburdened with money. But I also was surrounded, as many of you have been, by the twin strengths of family and faith while I was growing up, the kind of setting that instills confidence and hope, a belief in oneself. As such, I never accepted from others, nor restricted myself to the idea that there were things I couldn't do if I so chose. So by placing no restrictions on your horizons, a broad range of possibilities exist for each and every one of you. And perhaps one of you someday will come back here as a United States Senator, although I hope you'll wait until I retire voluntarily. <laughs> but whatever you choose to do, the mark of the truly successful individual will be to work and live within a framework of principles and strongly held values that have long graced our country. Values of community and fairness, of honesty and hard work. Only by holding fast to unchanging principles and changing times, to paraphrase former President Jimmy Carter, will you do justice to yourself, your family, and your community. By sticking with these principles, you won't be making your life's decisions in a vacuum. You'll have the backdrop of a strong moral and ethical framework to guide you. The concept of staying true to one's principles is not I would add some abstract ideal from a civics classroom textbook is a very real and admirable trait to hold on to. And as your lives and careers unfold, it'll be up to each one of you to decide how exactly you want to apply these principles and what role you'll play in the future. Each one of you will have a part to play, large or small, in determining how America reacts to and anticipates progress. Will she be a nation of unkept promises and dreams deferred? Or can we pick up the strands of change and embrace new technologies while preserving a caring society? I believe that each of you has what it takes to make a difference in this world. Never think you can't make a difference because you already have. In the state of Maine and New Hampshire and wherever you're from, our nation needs you to seize the limitless potential inside yourselves and to act upon it. As Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man and woman who's actually in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, a leader who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. Well, I believe in the potential in each of you to be leaders, to make things happen, and to use your education to solving the issues of the day. Graduates from this day forward, life itself will take on an element of constant challenge, and it falls to you as a torchbearers of the miraculous future to ponder the nature of that change and to chat ways to both control it and to exploit it. The way I see it, there are basically three types of people in this world, and you must decide which group you're going to join. One group is called the unloving critics. Unloving critics are the people who identify the problems we face in our society, but do nothing to try to solve them. They spend their time tearing down the system instead of trying to improve it. The second group is called the uncritical lovers. Uncritical lovers are the people who are satisfied with the status quo. They think everything's A-OK. -okay. They need to question where we've been or where we're going. They're just going along for the ride. And the third group, which I encourage all of you to join, is called the loving critics. Loving critics are the people who offer criticism, but at the same time take it upon themselves to offer solutions to the problems they see. These are the people willing to sacrifice to become involved in our society. They are the ones who care about the people in the world around them and who strive to improve the quality of life, not only for themselves, but for everyone. So I challenge you to become loving critics, to make a commitment to do your share, whether that means volunteering at a local hospital, a little league team, or becoming a big brother or big sister. It doesn't matter how you get involved. What's important is that you all get involved and stay involved throughout your lives so that you can deliver a better world to your children and grandchildren. As you leave your high school years behind you today, you do so with new freedoms as well as new responsibilities. And remember the words of Bobby Kennedy when he said, the youth of today must realize that the future does not belong to those who are content, apathetic towards common problems, timid and fearful in the face of new ideas and bold projects, 
Rather, the future will belong to those who can blend passions, reason and courage, and a personal commitment to the ideals and great enterprises of American society. Graduates, you're certainly not timid souls. You're at the dawn of your very best years, years of growth, years of enterprise, where anything is possible. Accept my challenge to go out there and make a difference. This is a time for new hopes, new opportunities, new challenges, and a new generation, yours. And indeed, with a generation of loving critics leading America into the next millennium, we are sure to have a future even more glorious than our past. And so I wish every success in this day of dual celebrations, a day to cheer the successful completion of high school, and also to celebrate the years of opportunity and fulfillment which await each of you. I'll leave you with the words of Winston Churchill, who made this proclamation when the tide of World War II was starting to turn in the Allies' favor. He said, this is not the end. It's not the, even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. So I thank you very much for inviting me to be here. Good luck and God bless you. I wish you Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Snow. Joining me in presenting the diplomas to the class of 1996 is Chuck Clement, Vice President of Burbrook's Board of Trustees. Mr. Clement and the trustees of the Academy, it is my pleasure on behalf of the faculty to present the members of the class of 1996 for their diplomas. Christopher Andrew Brown. <laughs> Sean B. Canada. Jonathan Candy. Sarah Corrette. Sandra Cruzavala. <laughs> Seth H. Darlington. Ellis. Ryan W. C. Ellis. Ashley Elizabeth Flynn. Heather Christina Furrow. David G. Goodwin.
Jennifer Goldston. Eric Greeley. Caitlin Greenglass. Kurt A. Jackson. Christopher H. Keller. Ryan Michael Laub. Legend. <laughs> Jennifer N. Mazika. Alexander Page Mead. <laughs> Stefania Rogers Metallius. Garrett M. Morgan. James A. Myers. Jonathan J. Nielsen. Jake Baxter Potter. Would Mrs. Rio please join us for a moment? Dominic L. Rio. James Patrick Shirley. Jason P. Sudet. Kelly Marie Spellman. <laughs> J. 
Jeremy Adams Works. Congratulations to the class of 1996. The Cogswell Medal is awarded to the Academy's valedictorian. Dominic Rio has had a remarkable career at, at Berwick Academy. His athletic achievements, a thousand points in basketball, undefeated, untouched in tennis, have been quietly and consistently matched by academic achievements. He is a member of the Cum Laude Society and the French Honor Society. This fall, we'll find Dom traveling to Philadelphia to attend the University of Pennsylvania. I have said before on another occasion that my lasting memory of Dom will not be the thousand points and will not probably be the valedictorian. It will not be the uh, tennis. It will be the, his assists in basketball. In both his great talents and in his uh, desire to assist others with those talents, Dom represents the best in all of us. It is my honor to present the Cogswell Gold Medal winner and the valedictor valedictorian of the class of 1996, Dominic Rio. Good morning and welcome to honored guests, parents, faculty, and graduates. During the past several weeks, I'm sure that all of my classmates have received congratulatory remarks for their successful completion of secondary school. Undoubtedly, many of these comments have included some statement classifying the upcoming graduation as either the relieving culmination of four years of hard work or the much anticipated commencement of life in the world beyond high school. Although this event does mark a transitional period in our lives, and right now it may seem to be a beginning or an end or both, I believe that years from now, we'll see our graduation for its true worth. One more step along our personal journey, journey toward emotional maturity. This commencement, like all of the events and experiences of our lives, may reflect a portion of our personal journey, but it is not the journey itself. One of the senior electives that the English department offers each year is a course called The Journey. In this course, students read and study the literal and figurative journeys of characters in Jane Eyre, Alice in Wonderland, Heart of Darkness, and Pilgrim's Progress, among others. What becomes apparent by the conclusion of this study is that in literature, as in life, regardless of the details and experiences that may appear to make them unique, there is a singular journey. It is a journey that must be undertaken alone, and it is a journey inward. As we take our leave of Berwick with high hopes and secure confidence, we leave understanding that whatever lies ahead for each of us is a continuation of the journey that we undertook here. We will continue to be exposed to new subjects and people and experiences, none of which we can ever fully know, but aspects of which, we, which, we, which can and will shape our lives. Those aspects that we choose to look at, that we choose to pay attention to and know, will both dictate who we will become and bring us closer to our true selves. As I look back on my years at Berwick and consider the wealth of opportunities placed at my disposal, I begin to understand the limits of the human realm. I would love to be able to stand before you today and say that I know calculus, or that I'm sure of all the contributing factors that led to the massacre at Wounded Knee. I would love to be able to tell you that I have learned what does and doesn't make for effective student government, and that I know how to complete an undefeated record in an individual sport and manage to save my opponent's dignity. I would love to be able to say that I know all of these, th these things, but I don't. Not really. What I do know, better at least, is myself, 
and calculus and wounded knee and student government and undefeated seasons have helped. And I understand th these as the unique gifts that the Hilltop has bestowed upon me. As we venture forth from these walls, I hope that we can find new ways to use our experiences to continue our journey inward. I hope that we will seek ways to become closer to our true selves and find a new home for the next leg of our journey. In one of his essays, Michael Doris describes home as the taken for granted base that one must quit in order to harbor the dream that it might one day be recovered. And so we leave this home that we have known and venture forth to Philadelphia and Florida, to Colorado and Connecticut, to Boston and Washington and New York and dozens of places between. Each of us is seeking the comfort and simplicity that we have known, yet is realizing that we must leave this home in order to someday find it again and begin to possess it truly. I am struck by two sentiments as I leave this hilltop. I offer the first to my fellow graduates. Last night and this morning, we have shared many reflections on our time here together. There are a thousand anecdotes and a thousand more adjectives that typify our group. But what I will remember most is how passionately each of us has, have courted our challenges, whatever they have been. In the words of a famous songwriter, we were young together. I don't know of any other group with whom I would rather have spent my youth. There's a story in the book Songlines by Bruce Chatwin in which he describes a wealthy white tourist in Africa who hired a group of natives to assist him on his travels. He subjected them to a series of forced marches in blistering heat with little food or water. At one point, the natives sat down and refused to budge. No amount of coaxing or money could persuade them to go forward. When the tourists finally asked why they had stopped, they replied simply that they needed time to let their souls catch up. My sincere hope for each of us is that wherever we may travel to, college and beyond, that we will find ourselves in a place where our souls and our bodies are aligned. And if we ever fi find ourselves faced with what feels like a forced march, we'll take the time and courage to sit down until we are sure that our soul is with us. I speak my final sentiment to some unique people who have affected my life and helped bring me closer to myself. I speak it to Sean and Lydia, who left this hilltop before their time. I speak it to Mr. Sherbon, who through two years of English and nine varsity seasons has offered me his wit and wisdom, his counsel and care, and in a final gracious gesture has offered to share his alma mater with me. I speak it to a man who when I arrived on this campus seven years ago, I knew as the new headmaster, who in eighth grade I knew as my ethics teacher, who in freshman year became my advisor, and who when he brought his family to my national tournament one Thanksgiving and was able to sort, support me as I fell flat on my face, I knew was also a friend. I speak it to Dorothy Green and Marie Donahue and Chad Ledgett and Poppy Hagen and all of those who came before them and between them and who will come after them, who as I have been, were charged with the duty of standing before their classmates at commencement and delivering some sense of wisdom using an 18 year old voice. I speak it finally and most fondly to my first and finest friend, who also happens to be my younger brother. It was no accident that my thousandth point was scored an assist from you, John. You've been assisting me all my life. In order to express this sentiment clearly, I'll borrow from another culture. In India, when people part after being together for a while, they often offer another sentiment. Uh, they often offer one another the sentiment, namaste. Roughly translated, it means, I honor that place in you that is best. I honor that place in you that is love and light and truth and peace. I honor that place in, that is mon, most uniquely you. Wherever our journeys may lead us, if you are in that place in you and I am in that place in me, there is only one of us. Thank you and safe journeys. Thank you very much, Dominic. Um, after our recessional, the uh, class of 1996 will form a receding line. Uh, we encourage you to use that opportunity to congratulate all the members of the class. It looks like the rain will hold off and we'll have time to do that. You are also invited to a light buffet in the Commons. Thank you all for helping to honor and celebrate the class of 1996. Reverend McConnell will deliver the benediction Please remain seated during the recessional and so that uh, all can view the final march of the class of 1996. Reverend McConnell.
word amen is really a word that belongs to the people. It's a way of saying yes, or I agree, or let it be so. And so at the end of this prayer, when I say amen, if it sits well with you, then you may respond in voice or shout or song, amen. It's an old prayer, and I would ask you not to bow your heads, but to take a last look around at the people around you, the buildings, and at this place. Let us pray. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm on your face. The rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you.